Hey everybody, welcome to part two of the bow and arrow tutorial series. In this video, we're going to learn how to turn in place. So in the last video, we set up aim offsets and basic bow and arrow functionality, but we weren't able to actually turn in place. The character was basically sliding as we were turning in place. So now when we turn 90 degrees to the left or to the right, we will play a turn in place animation and actually rotate the body. So it's going to look a lot more natural. So let's get started. So we have our project, right? And we're turning in place in this sort of sliding manner that doesn't look very natural. So the first thing I'd like to do here is to rotate the root bone back to normal so that we're actually rotating our body and the root component, the capsule, will be rotating along with our mouse movement. But I want the root bone to rotate back. Now the reason for this is because once we finally reach 90 degrees, we're going to smoothly take that root yaw offset, the offset in the yaw rotational direction, and smoothly make it come back to zero so that we can rotate the body while we're turning. So what we're going to do is open our ABP Archer. That's the animation blueprint. And we're going to go to our anim graph all the way out to just before the output pose. And we're going to add a rotate root bone. So rotate root bone. And this allows us to specify an amount to rotate the root bone by. And that's going to rotate the bone itself and not the root component of the character which is the capsule. Now, if we rotate the root bone in the yaw rotational direction, we can just add, say, 45 here and see what that looks like. If we do that, you'll see that we're rotated by 45 degrees, so we're just kind of offset. Now, we want to rotate back by a certain amount, and that amount is going to be the offset from our starting yaw to where we're aiming at. So essentially, we're going to have a variable that we can plug in to the yaw here. Now with rotate root bone selected, we don't really care about changing the pitch of the root bone. We don't even need that exposed as a pin. So I can click the drop down and uncheck expose as pin. And same thing for this mesh to component. We don't need that either. So I'm going to go ahead and uncheck expose as pin. And now we just have rotate root bone in the yaw. So what do we actually need to plug in to this yaw? Well, we're going to have a variable. So I can right click on this and promote it to a variable. And it's going to be the offset of our yaw for the root bone. So we're going to call this root yaw offset. So I'm going to take that new variable and call it root yaw offset. And we need to calculate what this should be. So we're going to do that in the event graph. I'm going to go ahead and close out of all these tabs except for the anim graph. So we need to do something here in our event blueprint update animation. This happens every frame. And so what I'd like to do is add another pin to our sequence node. And I'm going to go ahead and make a function to call for this fourth thing that we're doing every frame. So I'm going to go ahead and move some nodes up to make some room. I don't really want this getting in the way. I'll just put it right there. And for the then for case, we're going to make a new function. So let's add a function here. And I'm going to call this function turn in place. So we have this turn in place function. And we're going to call this for the fourth thing that we do. So we're going to call turn in place right there. So I can drag that down. And that'll be our fourth thing that we do every single frame. And I'm going to drag these out so we can see clearly what's going on. So turn in place, all right? This is where it's all going to happen. And the first thing I'd like to do is calculate that root yaw offset that we're plugging into our rotate root bone node. So what exactly is this going to be? Well, let's head back into turn in place here. And every single frame, the first thing I'm going to do is check to see if we should do anything for turn in place. Because if we're running or falling, we shouldn't be turning in place. So we're going to check. We're going to make a branch here. So let's add a branch. And our condition will be checking the speed and our falling status. So we're going to take our ground speed. 
and to see if that's greater than zero. And we should also check to see if we're falling. So we're gonna get our is falling variable. If either of these are true, then we don't really need to calculate our root yaw offset. So we're gonna take these two and use an or Boolean. And if either of those is true, then what we'll basically do is zero out our root yaw offset. We'd like to put it to zero, but in a smooth manner. We wanna interpolate it down to zero. So we'll get our root yaw offset and we'll set it here, but I'd like to interpolate it from its current value down to zero. And we can interpolate floats with f interp2. So this will basically take the current value, that's gonna be root yaw offset, so we'll plug that in, and the target will be zero, and we'll interpolate very quickly. Our interp speed can be 20, and that will give us a relatively quick interpolation from the current value down to zero. Now, f interp2 is an interpolation function which requires delta time. So we're gonna need our delta time. And in the event graph, if we go up to the event blueprint update animation, we have access to delta time. And we can promote that to a variable and simply set that. And every frame, it'll be updated and we'll have access to it inside of our new function turn in place. So we can simply plug in that delta time x for delta time. So essentially, if we're running or falling, root yaw offset will be smoothly interpolating down to zero from whatever it was before. Now, what is it going to be? That's going to be the next thing we do. We're going to calculate our root yaw offset. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna have our character's rotation, basically our character's yaw is all that matters, right? But our character's rotation determines what direction the character is facing, specifically its root component. If I hit tilde and type show collision and enter that console command, I can see that my capsule is rotating along with my character. And it has a rotation. And we want to store that rotation while we're moving, while we're not turning in place. So that way we know what it was when we started turning in place. Essentially, we want to get the actor rotation. Now we have our character, it's stored in a variable. If we get that and drag off of it, we can type get actor rotation to simply get that rotational value. And we can store this in a variable. So let's go ahead and promote that to a variable. And this is our character's rotation. So we're just gonna call it rotation and every frame we're updating it. Now we're updating this while this condition is false, right? So it's actually our running and jumping rotation, right? So that's something to keep in mind. In fact, we could even call this running rotation or moving rotation. We'll call it moving rotation since we're setting this while we're either running or falling. So we're setting this every frame while we're moving and we can see what this value is, at least the yaw. We're interested in the yaw. The pitch and the roll are not really a concern to us. Now, if I right-click the output value and split the struct pin, I can see what this yaw is equal to with a print string node. So I'm gonna print string and simply hook that yaw straight in. And now if we compile and hit play, well, we don't see anything until we start moving or jumping. So if I start moving, now we're spamming that value. And we can see what our actor's rotation is. If we're facing this way, it's about zero. If we're facing this way, it's about 180 or negative 180. And we go into the positives or negatives. So we, we see that this is a world space rotation, right? And spamming the output log is a little bit annoying, but we can have our new messages replace the old ones by simply giving this a key value. So expanding print string and giving it a key, now we'll see that we're not going to spam it, we're just going to update that log. So now we see it up at the top left, and this allows us to see other print strings as well if we wanna see other values. And we're gonna be doing that, so what I'd like to do is use the append node, and we want to append strings. We can see what it is we're printing out. We're gonna print 
moving rotation yaw, so we can enter that into A, and B can simply be our actual yaw value, and then we can plug in that return value to our print string node. So now we can see what it is we're looking at, and it says now as we move, moving rotation yaw up there. So that's our yaw, right? And we're setting it as long as we're moving, and then as we stop, we're not setting it anymore. Now, the reason for that is because I'd like to do a calculation based on that last yaw value before we started moving, and as we're rotating our character while we're standing still, I'd like to accumulate how much we're rotating away from that rotational value. What's our offset? So we're updating this every frame while we're not moving, right? And what I want to do is calculate the difference from last frame. So we have a delta. So if we want the difference from last frame, we need another rotator value to store the value last frame. And we can update that value last frame with the value that moving rotation was before we updated it. So we can add a new variable. This can be a rotator, and we'll call this last moving rotation. And if we set this before we update moving rotation using moving rotation's value, then it'll store the previous frame. And once we've done that, we can see how much our rotation has changed. So I'm going to move this print string forward a bit, and I'm going to recombine these into the single rotator output so it's not expanded anymore. And we can see the difference between last frame and this frame for our character's rotation by getting a delta rotator. So for the delta rotator, we're going to take our moving rotation for A and last moving rotation for B. And if we split this struct pin and plug the yaw in to our print string, we can change this append to say delta yaw, and we can see what this looks like. So we can go ahead and hit play, and if we're moving and rotating, we see that we have a delta yaw. So this can be used to accumulate a change in yaw. Now, we want to do this when we're standing still as well, so what we'll actually do is we'll update this in the false case, so I can disconnect that and move these down into the false case so we're updating this while we're not moving now. But when we are moving, we should set the moving rotation and last moving rotation both to the same value. Basically, we're going to get actor rotation, set moving rotation, so I'm going to duplicate those here, and we'll set last moving rotation, so I'm going to duplicate that, equal to moving rotation. So the difference between these two is we're setting last moving rotation first with the old value. Now we're doing this when we are not moving. And then when we were moving, we were updating these every frame. Both of them were the current value. So now if we compile and hit play, I can see my delta yaw as I'm standing still, but if I start moving, we're not printing that string. Now, here's the reason why we're doing all this. We want this delta, and we want to change our root yaw offset, because we know that it's going to be zero, or at least getting down to zero while we're moving. When we're not moving, it's going to start at zero, but as our yaw is changing, we should change that root yaw offset. So we can take our root yaw offset and set that using this value from the delta rotator. So what I'd like to do is set root yaw offset equal to root yaw offset minus the yaw from our delta rotator here. So root yaw offset minus our basically delta yaw. And now we can hook this up to the print string node, and we can use root yaw offset in the print string and type root yaw offset in the append node, so now we can see what it's equal to. Now we see that it's zero, and as we move to the right, it's decreasing. And as we move to the left, it's increasing. And notice that our character is now standing still. It's not rotating, the feet are not sliding, and that's thanks to rotate root bone. And we can go back to the anim graph and remind ourselves, 
rotate root bone takes this root yaw offset. So essentially what we're doing in turn in place is getting the delta between our actor rotation from last frame to this frame and subtracting that difference to root yaw offset every frame. And that allows us to keep an offset value that we can use to rotate the root bone back. So this is the first thing we do. And the reason we are interpolating smoothly down to zero when we're moving is because it might be something like 75. And when we start moving, we want to smoothly rotate our root bone back to normal, right? We don't want a rotational offset anymore. And I'll just show you without interpolating what happens. So instead of interpolating, if we simply set root yaw offset to zero when we're moving, here's what happens if we have that root yaw offset. Say it's about 90, then we snap as soon as we start moving again. So it's a good idea to interpolate smoothly rather than just zeroing it out directly. So these are the first steps, right? We have our root yaw offset, we're calculating that. Let's go ahead and comment this section here and say, calculate root yaw offset. So that's the first step. And if we are moving, then we're basically resetting our variables. So here we'll move these over here. We'll give these a comment and we'll say zero out root yaw offset and reset moving rotation slash last moving rotation. And this branch here is checking to see if we're moving. So let's comment this as well. And we'll say, are we moving? So we have our root yaw offset and it's making our root bone go back to normal. So that's great, but we want to play some turning animations when that root yaw offset reaches a certain value. If we see our debug print string, we see that we're about negative 90 right here. And that's where we should turn to the right. And we're at positive 90 here, which is when we should turn to the left. Now we do have some turning animations. In our asset browser, we can search for turning, or turn rather, and we have turn left 90, which looks like this, and we have another animation for turning right, turn right 90. And there are 180 degree versions as well, but we're concerned with the 90 degree versions. So turn left 90 has basically all this extra space at the end of it, and I'd like to trim it off. And before I trim the animation, I'm gonna duplicate it so I can keep the original. So I'm gonna right click on turn left 90 and browse to the asset and duplicate it. So I'm gonna right click on it, duplicate and call the duplicate turn left and I'm going to open it up and here in turn left I'd like to basically trim this down at the very end when that foot stops moving I'm going to right click and remove frames 28 to 72 and now we have a shorter animation now I'm going to do the same thing for turn right so I'm going to take turn right 90 right click and duplicate it and call this one turn right. And I'm going to open that and this one has a little bit of extra space in the beginning as well. So I'm going to go about to where the about to where the feet start turning here about right there. Right click and remove frames 0 to 12 and right at the end of the movement I'm going to right click and remove frames 39 to 91. So now I have a shorter animation. So now that I have these animations, I'd like to use them in the animation blueprint. And the place for that is going to be ground locomotion because I have this idle state and I can transition into turning animations from here. So I'm going to take my turn left, the one I trimmed and drag it in and drop it there and take my turn right and drop it there. And now we can add some transition rules for these. Now, just reminding myself, I'm going to hit play, and I see that my root yaw offset gets to positive 90 when I want to turn left. I'm going to take my transition from idle to turn left and double click that and check that root yaw offset value. I'm going to get it and see if it's greater than 90. So I'm going to say greater than 90, 
and hook that in and just see how this works. So pressing play, rotating my character, as soon as I hit 90, I play the turn in place animation. Now, I never transition back out. And another thing is, I never want to transition into this state, into turn left, if I'm moving, right? If my ground speed is greater than zero. So I want my ground speed to be equal to zero in order for this transition to succeed. So I'm gonna have an and Boolean here. And so I want both of these to be true. But I also want to be not falling. So I'm gonna get is falling and get a not Boolean for this and add a pin to the and because that should also be the case. We should not be falling either. So we can transition into the state, but when do we transition back out? Well, we should transition back out in a number of cases. So we'll go from turn left back to idle and open this transition rule. And I'd like to transition back as soon as we've played a good amount of our animation, about 75%. So I'm going to get a time remaining ratio for turn left and see if it's less than 0.25. So if we played 75% of the animation, we can transition back. But I want more conditions that can allow me to do this. So I'm going to have an or Boolean this time. The last one was an and, but going back to idle, we want an or. So multiple conditions can trigger this transition. Another condition should be our ground speed. We should transition if it becomes greater than zero. So if that's greater than zero, we'll go back to idle. And also if we're falling, so if is falling is true, we'll transition back. So if any of these three happen, we'll transition back. So now if I go back and start that animation, well, if root yaw offset is not greater than 90, we'll stop playing. And also if the animation finishes 75%, we'll stop. And if we start moving, we'll stop turning in place as well. So that gives us some ways to get back out of that state. And we're going to do the same thing for turning to the right. So we'll add a transition rule for turn right and go into that. And just reminding myself, if I turn right, root yaw offset is negative, And I want to go to the turn right animation if it becomes less than negative 90. So we'll get our root yaw offset and see if it's less than negative 90 we should transition, but we're gonna have an and just so we can have some extra checks. So and Boolean, and we want our ground speed to be zero. In fact, we have these conditions, ground speed and is falling with a not Boolean. We can copy those and come back and use those here. So we'll transition if all three of these is true. The most important being that root yaw offset. Now we can have a turn right back to idle, and this is going to be similar to the other one. We're going to get a time remaining ratio, and we're going to see if the time remaining ratio is less than 0.25 again. And also we need an or, so or boolean, because we should transition back if ground speed becomes greater than zero or we're falling. So that's going to be the same as this, ground speed greater than zero and falling. So I'll copy that and paste those in here and expand and add more pins to the or. And now we have our turning right animations. And we stop playing them when appropriate. Okay, so this is good. We have the turn in place animations. That's the next step. So now what we need to figure out is how to actually rotate that root bone so we're actually turning in the direction that we should. Now to do that, I'm going to go into our animation turn right. And there are some curves here. We have this curve called distance curve. And if we double click that, we can see what the curve looks like. And it goes from negative 90 at zero seconds all the way up to zero at about 0.7 seconds. Now what I'd like to do is use this curve to affect our rotation. And to do that, we need to know if we're playing this animation. And to know if we're playing the animation, I'm gonna add a new curve, basically a curve that's always one, so a straight line. And if we get that curve value, 
it'll be one if we're playing the animation and it'll be zero if we're not. So here's how we add a curve. We go to curves, click the drop down, and I want a metadata curve. Metadata curves are designed for what I just described, a curve that's equal to one when it's playing and zero when it's not. So if we go to add metadata and scroll all the way down, we can create a new one. So we're gonna do that and we're gonna call this curve turning. And here it is, we can't even double click it because it's just a curve that has the value of one when we're playing this animation. We're gonna add this to turn right as well as turn left. So here in turn left, we're gonna click the drop down for curves, add metadata, but the turning curve, as soon as we created it, already exists, so we can just select that, and now we have the turning curve here. And we can check the value of turning. We'll go back to ABP Archer, go into the event graph, in fact, we need our turn in place function here. And since we're gonna do multiple things here, I'm gonna put a sequence node. So right here, before calculating root yaw offset, I'm gonna add a sequence, and the root yaw offsets, the first thing we'll do and the second is we're gonna check that curve value. So since we're in the animation blueprint, we can right click and type get curve value. And we can specify what curve. We're gonna specify the turning curve. And just to see what this looks like, let's use a print string node and plug it right in and compile and press play. We see that it's zero. And when we're turning in place, it's not zero. And you'll see that it kind of ramps up to one. It doesn't actually snap to one, but it blends into it because we may be blending into this animation. And that means we're blending into our turning curve value. That's kind of how these curve values work. So we know that this is greater than zero when we're playing one of those turning animations. And we can check that. We can take the return value see if it's greater than zero, and use this as a branch condition. So we'll plug that in, and what we'll basically do here is comment this branch and say, is turning, question mark. So if we are turning, then we know that we can access the distance curve values. So here we have distance curve, right? And what I'd like to do is get a delta, because as our distance curve value changes, it's going from negative 90 all the way up to zero, and every single frame, I wanna see how much it's changed. And we can accumulate that, like we're doing with our root yaw offset. So here's how we'll do it. We're gonna do another get curve value. So get curve value, and this time, we're gonna use our distance curve. So it's called distance curve, that's what we'll put in for the curve name, distance curve, one word. And we're going to cache this value. We're going to store it in a variable. So let's make some room down here. I'll move these down. And right-click the return value, promote it to a variable, and call this distance curve. So we know its value every frame. We're going to set that if we're turning here. But I'd like to see the delta from the last frame. So I'm going to add another variable and call this last distance curve. And this is going to be a float. And like we did with our rotation, I'm gonna set this right here to the value of distance curve before we update distance curve. That way we have its old value. So because we have last distance curve and the current frames distance curve, we can get the difference between those two. So we can take distance curve and subtract last distance curve. So we have the delta. And I'm gonna go ahead and promote this to a variable and call this delta distance curve. So now that we have this delta distance curve, we can use this to affect our root yaw offset. Now, how do we wanna do that? Well, our root yaw offset is negative 90 when we're turning right, so we're gonna to want to add values to root yaw offset every frame, and we're gonna add that delta distance curve every single frame, but that's only if root yaw offset is negative. If we're turning left, root yaw offset is positive, which means we want to subtract that delta distance curve. So we're gonna have a condition here. We're gonna make a branch, and the condition will be if root yaw offset is greater than zero. So we're gonna get root yaw offset, see if it's greater than zero, that means we're turning left. 
right? So we're going to have a comment on this branch and say uh, root yaw offset greater than zero, question mark, turning left. So if it's greater than zero, we're turning left, and that means that root yaw offset is positive. So we want to subtract our delta distance curve. So we're going to take root yaw offset, subtract delta distance curve, and take the result of that and set root yaw offset. So we'll get our root yaw offset and set that to this value. Now, what if root yaw offset is not greater than zero? Well, that means we're turning right and we need to add delta distance curve. So we can duplicate these two, but we're gonna add this time and set root yaw offset to that result. So essentially, either case, root yaw offset is getting smaller, right? We're taking however much our distance curve changed since last frame, and we're shaving that off of root yaw offset. Now, we're gonna have an excess amount of yaw because root yaw offset is going to be greater than 90, and we don't want it to be greater than 90. That's why if I play test this, we see that turning in place doesn't quite look right, and that's because we have to take off the excess of the yaw if the yaw is greater than 90. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our root yaw offset. We're going to get its absolute value, and we're going to cache this. So we're going to promote this to a variable and call this abs root yaw offset. We're going to set this whether we're turning left or right. Now this is the absolute value of root yaw offset, and if it's greater than 90, so we'll do a greater than and use 90 here, then we'll have a branch. And we'll calculate the excess yaw. We're going to take abs root yaw offset and subtract 90 from it, so subtract 90, and whatever's left is the excess yaw. We're going to promote this also to a variable, so promote to variable and call this yaw excess. So we now have our excess yaw, so we're going to take these nodes and comment them and say calculate yaw excess. And what we want to do is make root yaw offset smaller by this amount. Now that depends on if it's positive or negative, so we'll have another branch here and see if root yaw offset is greater than zero again. So root yaw offset greater than zero, that'll be our condition here, and if it is, then we want to take root yaw offset and subtract yaw excess. So we'll get root yaw offset, we'll get yaw excess, we'll subtract the two, and we'll set root yaw offset to this. But if root yaw offset is not greater than zero, then it's either zero or negative. So that means we need to add yaw excess to it. If it's negative, to make it smaller, we're going to add this value. So instead of subtracting, we'll add and hook that up. And now we've taken care of the excess yaw. So this will say compensate for excess yaw. And now that we've done that, if we press play, now we're actually turning. And it looks great. Now, her back leg does lift off the ground, and that's actually in her idle animation. Let's go to our anim graph and go to ground locomotion and idle, and we can search for idle here. And we use, say, travel mode idle. Then we see that that back leg is down, and she is lifted a little bit. I could go to the character blueprint which is, of course, in the third-person folder, BP third-person character, which I'd like to move, actually, into my Archer folder. So I'm moving that in here, and let's see, I can move the mesh down a bit. So I'll turn off snapping, move it down a bit. Yeah, so that looks better. So, you know, with the right animations, and, of course, you can edit the animations, those feet will look better. I'm going to put it back to idle front end. So we now have turning in place, and this is looking great, but we can't aim to the left and right. 
but the beauty of this is we do have an aim offset and we are using the pitch from our base aim rotation. Now we can use our root yaw offset for the yaw. Now we don't want to use root yaw offset directly. It's gonna be the wrong sign, right? Because root yaw offset is compensating for the direction we're moving. It's going in the opposite direction. So what we need to do is scale root yaw offset by negative one. So we're gonna multiply that by negative one here and hook that into the yaw. And now if we play test, we have our aim offset and we can aim in any direction now. And this is great. And as soon as we aim past 90 degrees, we rotate. Excellent. That's gonna wrap it up. And now I'm done with my print string node. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that from my turn in place function right here. And now we have really nice turning in place animation. So this is really rounding this out because before it was just sliding and now we actually have that aim offset working on the upper half of the body. So we can aim in different directions, the feet stay still, and once we reach a certain angle, we actually turn in place and it looks great. So that's gonna wrap it up. I hope you liked this video. If you did, go ahead and like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. It really helps this channel out quite a bit. And go ahead and leave a comment below and let me know what are some of the things that you would like me to cover in this bow and arrow tutorial series? We have some interesting things coming up. For one, if I step up onto a ledge, that back leg just kind of hovers there and we'd like some leg IK, right? We'd like to have those legs bend in a natural manner. This is kind of becoming standard now as that's a feature that comes with our default third person character. So we're gonna do that for Sparrow here and that's gonna be in the next video. And another thing I'll point out is that we have all these variables here in this animation blueprint and it'd be nice if we could have multiple animation blueprints to specialize for basic things like this animation blueprint can take care of basic ground movement but what about if we don't want to be aiming we want our bow lowered or what if she wants to put the bow on her back and pull out a sword right so we may wish to have multiple animation blueprints and switch between those two and we can do that with linked anim layers a new unreal engine 5 feature and we'll be covering those soon as well so if you like this video check out my patreon i have a link in the description below and you'll be able to access the videos for these a day before they come out and there's exclusive content only for patreon members as well as early access to my newest udemy course Unreal Engine 5 C++, the ultimate game developer course. If you want to start taking that course now, it's available on my Patreon, and I'm uploading the videos as I create them, so you're accessing this before the Udemy students will ever even get to see it, so that's exciting. So I hope you like this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.